I'm Stephen Cope. I grew up in Southern California, a little town called Marietta. Um, uh, I moved up to Provo uh, right after graduating high school, so I, I went to BYU um, uh, in 2007 and studied commercial music there. Um, and I've been living in Provo ever since. Uh, I love it here. Um, I own a recording studio over on 9th East, uh, and I live a couple blocks away from there in Provost, the Provost neighborhood. I, I ran sound at Muse Music uh, for a few years uh, until they closed recently, unfortunately. Um, and I'm teaching at Walden, uh, so I probably know uh, a lot of a lot of y'all's kids, um, and probably many of you all personally. Uh, yeah, I teach music classes there, and I love it. Um, I uh, often offer, offer community classes, uh, free classes at my studio for folks interested in audio. So uh, I'd love to meet you all there if you're interested in audio. Um, I grew up in the LDS church, uh, and Mormonism is a huge part of my, my background and my identity. I mean, that's part of why I love living in Provo, is it's, it's what I know. I, I, I uh, know how to exist around here, and uh, I understand people's, people's cultural backgrounds to a large degree, uh, what people's interests are, where they're coming from, belief systems, things like that. Yeah, so I'm married, uh, uh, and my wife Erica, uh, Erica Eddington, she's a florist in Provo. She's awesome. Uh, we're living, yeah, so we're both living in a house with a friend in the Provost neighborhood. Um, uh, yeah, uh, we, we, we met at Valor, uh, which is a local music club, uh, music venue. Um, we started dating, uh, uh, dated for, for a few years and decided to uh, get married. We got married up in, in Provo Canyon. So I, I do a lot of music production around here. Uh, I play shows at Valor. I'm in a band called Quiet House. I play organ. Um, I, I'm actually playing, uh, I guess this doesn't matter because it's gonna come out after, but I'm playing in Battle of the Bands on Saturday. Um, I've been involved in um, some, uh, I uh, founded with some friends, I founded a, uh, uh, advocacy organization called um, called uh, the Medusa Collective. Um, and the Medusa Collective was uh, basically aimed toward, it was an organization uh, that advocated for uh, women and non-binary people in, in the music and art scene in Provo um, and Salt Lake. Uh, and so for a few years, we did a lot of education, uh, organized a lot of events, um, you know, stirred up, uh, stirred up the status quo a little. Uh, that's when I started offering those free audio workshops at my studio. Oh yeah, so non-binary gender is, uh, uh, people who identify as non-binary are people who uh, feel as though uh, the labels male, female, man, woman uh, don't uh, are insufficient labels for their the way they perceive their gender. Uh, anyone can identify as non-binary. Uh, doesn't matter how you look. Doesn't matter how you were raised. Um, just if 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 you don't want want to identify with maleness or femaleness, uh, you can identify as non-binary. So Murrieta is, um, uh, it's between kind of LA and San Diego. It's in Riverside County. Uh, yeah, and it's a, it's a funny little kind of uh, residential, suburban kind of town. Uh, uh, there's a lot of LDS folks there, and so, uh, I think there are a lot of people from Marietta who live in Provo now, which is cool. Uh, and yeah, it's a good good town, about 45 minutes from the beach, uh, from San Diego. Uh, yeah, beautiful area, a lot of wine. 
I think democracy works best, uh, and I think people have their needs met most when uh, the voices of underrepresented people are amplified, uh, when people of color, people uh, with uh, disabilities, um, women, uh, LGBT people, uh, when, th when the voices of, of these generally unheard people are amplified to be on the same level as everyone else's voices. Uh, and so things like the Medusa Collective and my, uh, even at my studio, I do, I do my best to, um, I make efforts to involve as many people who may otherwise not have opportunities as possible. Um, uh, so, I mean, that's a big part of why I'm running for mayor is I, I think uh, representation of young people, of, of LGBT people, and of people of all demographics. It's important that everyone be represented in, in our governments uh, and in our businesses and in our music and art scenes. Um, uh, if people aren't being represented, their needs are going unmet. Democracy isn't really working the way it's supposed to. Um, so, I mean, I, I think that that's something I'm really passionate about. And it, it, uh, these, those things uh, make their way into my own music, uh, my own projects, as well as the way I operate within our community, I think. So I haven't been directly involved with In Circle House. I've, uh, I want to. Uh, and uh, I'd love to start vol volunteering there. Um, uh, and I've had some interactions with Food and Care and United Way, uh, and I've been, um, one thing I've been trying to do personally, uh, because, so our, uh, our city leadership has uh, made a pretty big stance uh, regarding panhandling uh, and uh, this idea that we shouldn't be giving money directly to, to panhandlers. There was an ordinance passed a few years ago uh, that bans people from handing money to panhandlers or anyone, anything to anyone. But I think it was kind of directed towards panhandlers, uh, not giving money to panhandlers through a car that's not parked in a legal, illegally designate, designated parking space. Um, so uh, with my studio, I've uh, been making an uh, effort to uh, donate a portion of, of the studio's proceeds to organizations like Food and Care Coalition. Uh, and there was another organization. Um, it might have just been ACLU uh, a few months ago. Uh, and I hope to continue doing that. Um, it's not a lot. I, uh, I don't. Uh, my studio is successful, but uh, I would love to do more. I would love to uh, become more actively involved in um, in caring for the homeless. Uh, but uh, with the, the means that I have, that's what I've been able to do. Yeah, so there's this question of uh, uh, how, how do we solve this parking problem in downtown? Uh, how do we solve these parking issues that students are having south of BYU campus? Um, so if we approach it from a cultural, a cu cultural uh, if we take a cultural approach and uh, interrogate, okay, why are people frustrated about parking? Uh, what, is it, what is it that um, people are viewing as being a parking problem? Uh, and uh, there is... To a degree, people in Provo are used to be being able to park in front of whatever business they want to uh, want to patronize. Uh, just park immediately in front of it, uh, which is fine, and and uh, there's nothing wrong with expecting that or hoping for that. But as Provo does grow, that's going to become less and less realistic. So we have to address these cultural issues of uh, how do we change people's expectations, uh, uh, maybe parking, ha people parking a block away. Most of the time when I go downtown, uh, there's plenty of op open parking spaces, but with the temple in there, uh, and especially during conventions and things, um, people, people's struggle to find parking, it's legitimate, people are frustrated. 
Um, so there are some parking structures uh, that do already exist. Uh, the Wells Fargo Bank, Zions Bank, and there's that parking garage on 100, 100 West. 100, is that right? Yeah, 100 West, across from Marley's, uh, that tend to have vacant spaces. Uh, so I would love to work with the parking, the new parking administration uh, to, you know, put up signs, uh, educate the public on these uh, alternate parking options, work with Zions Bank and Wells Fargo to make those uh, parking structures more, you know, more, uh, more obvious, put up signs, um, you know, develop plans and initiatives to do that. Um, and those are short-term solutions. Even if we were to, you know, construct another parking garage, that's a, that's a short-term solution. As far as long-term solutions, we have things like walkability, bikeability, public transit. Yeah, how do we make people feel safe crossing 500, 500 West? Or there's been a lot of discussion about 500 North near the library and 7-Eleven over there. Um, and I know the city is planning on doing a trial run of some new tactical urbanism stuff. Uh, but yeah, so how do we, how do we encourage bicycling uh, to reduce congestion, increase parking, well, increase available parking because more people are on bikes? Um, and we can do that through, you know, by putting in more protected and painted bike lanes. Um, we can do that by making uh, clear share the road lanes on Center Street, maybe on Freedom, uh, where people know they're, they're going to be safe if they bicycle. Uh, I know Joaquin neighborhood has had, um, has been pushing really hard to uh, make Joaquin uh, n n even uh, beyond just um, making it, uh, making that neighborhood better accommodate bicyclists and pedestrians, making it a neighborhood for bicyclists and pedestrians and where automobiles are secondary. Um, and I think, you know, motorists, drivers tend to be wary of those things. But, but when we take into account all the people who will realistically be on the road, uh, we can improve traffic flow for everybody, improve everybody's safety. Um, without having to compromise the needs of one group of people. Um, yeah, so, and I think those things will uh, be really, a really important part of resolving our parking issues. And public transit, of course, is a big topic. A lot of people are either uh, really excited about bus rapid transit or they're frustrated about it. Um, at this point, I, I, I think bus, I'm personally, I support bus rapid transit. I support any, uh, transport, transportation improvements that make our city more accessible to its to the to the townspeople uh, that include and that has to include everybody. It can't just include uh, uh, it, it can't just include people who can afford cars. It can't just include people who can afford to live near downtown. Low income residents need need to be. Uh, represented and need to be, need to have the city accessible to them as well as everybody else. Um, and I'm really excited about bus rapid transit because it's going to make our um, downtown more accessible. The economy will develop. Uh, and I personally support initiatives to continue to expand bus rapid transit, add more bus routes. I would love to work with UTA on that. Um, uh, It'll help our, our air, we'll be reducing emissions, uh, looking toward the future as Provo continues to grow uh, in population, which it inevitably will. Um, so yeah, so th thinking overall, uh, my TLDR on this is uh, we need to look at both the short-term solutions for parking, uh, you know, considering new parking structures uh, and directing people's attention to currently existing parking structures. Um, but we also need to think about the long term uh, by improving Provo's bikeability and walkability and expanding our public transit system so that people have that as a realistic and af affordable option.
I would love to see data uh, surrounding how uh, making Center Street a walk only downtown uh, would affect businesses there. Uh, because I would love, aesthetically, I would love for downtown to be a walk, uh, pedestrian only uh, area. Um, uh, that said, uh, I don't want businesses to suffer for it. And if, uh, if making it walk only is going to reduce the amount of um, people uh, patronizing businesses downtown, uh, I, I don't think it's a good idea. I think we should uh, probably look at the data there before we make any decisions and, and get the opinions of business owners downtown because those are the people who will be uh, most affected by that. Um, yeah, so that's my thoughts on that. So uh, yeah, disabled folks uh, in Provo are definitely affected by a lack of sufficient parking. Uh, I, I think there are some things we can consider uh, to, to make parking circumstances in downtown Provo better for disabled folks. I, I would um, uh, strongly consider uh, dedicating, making more dedicated dis disabled parking spots. Um, uh, there's also issues with the city center being inaccessible um, and I guess with the new, we can talk about that with, with the new city center coming in, but, uh, yeah, that is a real issue, um, that, I mean, uh, other things that have been discussed are making parking downtown metered so that, uh, to kind of clear up, clear up people parking down there for long periods of time and, uh, I don't know if that's a if that's a go, going to be an effective long term solution, uh, and I th I think for that too we'd need to look at data. Is metering parking going to actually affect anything? Is it going to improve the situation for disabled people who want to park downtown? Uh, I think it's those things are questionable, and we should look into it. But consider everything, but look at the data. For me, when I look, when I envision Provo's e economic future, I imagine Provo as a city where where local, where townspeople are starting businesses, are freelancing, are starting collectives, and uh, uh, and occupying the majority of the economic sector of Provo, the economic ventures in Provo. Uh, I, to me, Provo's e economic future doesn't look like uh, Walmarts and Targets and uh, big box, tons of big box chains uh, overpopulating the city. Of course, they have a place. But uh, so uh, when I think about the roadblocks to economic development in, Pro in Provo, I think about, um, like we talked about transportation and getting people places, um, getting people downtown, uh, getting people to the startup area. Um, and I also think about um, uh, I guess there are two more two more uh, issues. I mean, yeah, there's the transportation issue. I also think about um, what about this culture that is currently developing of entrepreneurship, uh, the startup culture that I, I know the city has been trying to push. Uh, and, and I think they've been doing an awesome job. And I think just continuing in that direction is a good, um, that's a good thing to do. I think we should continue. Yeah, I love that One Million Cups is uh, getting people together, getting people collaborating. Um, uh, there is a third thing that I think is an, an issue, and uh, the, it's the lack of affordable housing in Provo uh, that is affecting townspeople of low to moderate income levels. Um, because when people are struggling to make rent, uh, they don't have the option to, to try and start new businesses and potentially fail. Uh, and they don't have the 
you know, they often don't have the funds to, to rent spaces. I mean, this is, has been true for myself uh, as a small business owner in Provo. It's been, uh, I would love to move to the downtown area or to the startup area, but it can be, a, it can be difficult to find housing that's affordable. The question of does Provo want big box retailers? Uh, what will we do to get them here? Um, the truth is corporate retail chains um, bring in sales tax taxes. They give the city money. It's revenue um, for the city. Uh, so those we can't realistically uh, keep out these retail chains. And, and I would... Uh, I think a lot of Provost Towns people do want retail chains like we saw with Trader Joe's, um, uh, with corporate chains like that. Uh, I am far more interested in uh, encouraging uh, local entrepreneurship uh, and uh, encouraging townspeople to shop local than I am uh, incentivizing, uh, incentivizing these large big box retail chains to come in uh, and uh, stamp out these small businesses, making life more difficult for, for townspeople. So uh, that said, because we do need these retail chains in, uh, we need to do, uh, we need to be judicious. Uh, and discuss with the, with the town. We need to have these open, open uh, discussions, which the city's been really good about doing lately. Um, but can, we need to have open discussions about it, uh, what is a retail chain that we want? Why do we want them here? So when, when we are making these decisions about what re retail chains to allow into our city, uh, we need to ask questions like, what... Um, how will this retail chain benefit the townspeople? Uh, what are their wage models like? Are they going to be hiring townspeople, Provo, Provo residents, and underpaying them, uh, contributing to poverty and um, homelessness? Uh, are they going to be? Are these retail chains going to um, be participating in the community? Uh, I was really excited to see even Stevens move in. Uh, because even Stevens has a history of working with the community, being heavily involved in things, and um, uh, and uh, giving giving to charities and things like that. So, um, yeah, we just need to look at these corporate chains rather than be desperately inviting them into our cities with uh, into our city with tax breaks and s subsidies. Yeah, I think it's also important to, when we do invite these chains and uh, work with them to make sure, and work with planning, uh, put them in areas like East Bay, keep our, uh, and uh, other areas that maybe could use economic stimulation, uh, and reserve downtown and the startup areas for smaller local businesses. So uh, regarding... Uh, entrepreneurship and people with uh, coming up with, there are so many people in Provo with uh, incredible innovative ideas. Um, uh, uh, Richard Gregory, who uh, is one of the owners of Station 22, uh, had uh, expressed some interest in uh, starting up a, a shop where he would sell uh, artisanal, artisanal, is that how you say it? Uh, where he would sell craft sodas and uh, also brew craft beer, uh, and people could go drink a soda with their friend while drink their friends drinking a beer. Uh, and um, uh, there's been fr some frustration because uh, that that idea was proposed to the city council and it wasn't brought up. Uh, it wasn't brought to a work session. There was uh, it wasn't put on the agenda. Um, so one one thing we do need to change that our city council and our mayor both need to be uh, in sync on is when people have entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial God, when people have inno innovative ideas, um, when people are wanting, townspeople are wanting to start up businesses and they're bringing them 
to the city council for approval. Uh, like a brew pub, uh, th there needs to be a, there needs to be discussion. Those things can't just be uh, brushed off as not what the people want. You can't know what the people want if you don't ask the people what they want. Um, and so I, I think there does need to be a cultural shift within the city council. There needs to be a shift towards uh, supporting more, uh, supporting small businesses uh, and uh, supporting people with innovative ideas. Uh, there needs to be a shift toward um, welcome, welcoming ideas that maybe are non-conventional in Provo. Uh, and that, I think that includes the potential potential for Provo to have a microbrewery. Uh, uh, there, there, I think people have this idea of uh, this is what Provo is. Uh, this, Provo is a Mormon town. Uh, people in Provo don't want a brew pub. But uh, uh, even within the past few months, the majority of people I've inter interacted with, Mormon or not Mormon, have been comfortable with a microbrewery that sells uh, art, sells craft sodas as well. Uh, and uh, yeah, I just think there needs to be more open discourse uh, surrounding these questions of what businesses uh, people, we should be encouraging people to start up. Social media is fundamental at this point, and I, I would argue that the internet is a fundamental part of our in infrastructure as a city. Um, and that's why I am supportive of the city's uh, collaboration with Google Fiber to get to make uh, the internet internet accessible to all, all townspeople. Um, uh, and social media is a big part of the way the city communicates with 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 the residents, and that the residents can uh, respond and engage with the city and give feedback and share their opinions. Um, we have groups like Provo Forward and Our Provo. Uh, and new Provo developments uh, on Facebook. Uh, city officials should be expected, uh, we should be expecting our city, city leadership, the city council, the mayor, uh, the school board, we should be expecting all of these people to be actively engaged in these Provo-related Provo Facebook groups, on Twitter. Uh, that, should be, that should be no question. We should be able to tweet at our city council person and get a response. We should be able to make a post in, in Provo Forward uh, about an issue that's important to us. And uh, our city leadership should be there participating actively in those discussions. Uh, it's, it's an extended, more accessible version of, of city council meetings. Um, uh, and one of the biggest complaints I've heard from people about city council meetings is they feel they go, which takes hours out of their day. They attend these city council meetings. They share their commentary, and their comments are ultimately maybe heard, but ultimately uh, not really that important. And so, uh, there there is an accountability that comes with uh, city leader. City leadership needs need to be accountable to the townspeople, and. Uh, we should be expecting city leadership to be involved actively on social media, which I would as mayor. Um, and I currently am. Uh, it's a big part of how I've connected to townspeople in Provo to date. It's uh, how I know, uh, it's how I've gotten to know people. Uh, and I would, uh, our city leadership needs to be deeply invested in, um, getting feedback from the townspeople, often via social media. There's a lot of talk about Provo's inevitable growth. Um, uh, my understanding is that the population is expected to, uh, to double in the next 40 or 50 years. Um, and these are things we need to anticipate. The big issues for me as far as growth goes is what is, uh, how do we make sure that residents, current townspeople, the people who make Provo what it is, how do we ensure that those people aren't uh, priced out of their homes? Uh, because we've see, we see housing costs rise. Uh, that's happening right now. Um, uh, other questions 
uh, tying this back into economic development, uh, how do we make sure that townspeople are supported economically in their businesses? Uh, and, and we've talked about how to do that through transportation, uh, improving public transportation to get people downtown. Um, but uh, I think I'd really love to talk about affordable housing um, because developers need to, developers, uh, we shouldn't be artificially restricting development in Provo. Um, uh, developers need to, there is a place for people to come in, develop new housing. Uh, there's a need for that because of our rising housing costs. Um, there are more people in Provo uh, and therefore landlords and developers can, can charge more for housing. Um, uh, the question is, what is the responsibility of developers uh, in stimulating population growth in Provo by developing new housing? And uh, I think we should be holding developers accountable to provide affordable housing for current townspeople. Um, uh, places, cities like Salt Lake City, uh, Boulder, Colorado, uh, Denver, uh, a lot of, a lot of um, cities, and Boulder, Colorado, Colorado is a really good example because it uh, has a simil similar population size to Provo, a simu similar college, it's a college town like Provo. Um, uh, all these cities have inclusionary housing programs, which essentially uh, uh, requires developers to build a build a percentage of affordable housing to include uh, a number of their units have to be uh, permanently affordable, and so this solves a number of issues uh, in that it allows current townspeople, who many of us are artists and biz small business owners, we're not. Uh, I mean, there are tech people, there are people who, who are uh, making money, but a lot of us aren't raking it in. We're just uh, surviving in our small town. Uh, and so uh, it's important for us to hold developers responsible for the, for the population stimulation they create. Um, so uh, I would strongly support uh, developing an inclusionary housing program in Provo. Uh, that requires developers to uh, to include an amount of permanently affordable housing in their new developments. Um, this would uh, desegregate affordable housing because, as as is, we see that areas with like Section Eight housing, like the Boulders, uh, tend to uh, home values around those areas tend to decrease. Um, there tends to be higher crime, uh, higher drug use, uh, and so uh, creating, and, and for the poor folks in those areas, the low-income low earners, uh, there's not much economic mobility because their neighbors are all uh, in the same economic class as them. Um, and so by integrating affordable housing uh, and dispersing it among new developments, uh, by requiring developers to do that, um, we are, we'll be able to uh, give townspeople places to live uh, without segregating them from the rest of the town. It's great because it, uh, it, it also places the burden on developers rather than taxpayers. Um, I would also support a cash in lieu program where developers could pay in to, um, rather than developing affordable housing, um, and including affordable housing among their market rate housing, they could pay cash into an affordable housing and homeless resources fund uh, that the city would um, would then use to build more affordable housing and to fund homeless resource centers like Food and Care Coalition, United Way, um, and other mental health and addiction recovery centers. So regarding the west side of Provo, uh, my top priority as a mayoral candidate is, um, is representation. Uh, because to this point, the west side of Provo has been underrepresented in city government, uh, and so their voices are being underheard. Um, 
and so I would, uh, before we even decide on what goes into West Provo, what happens there, we should be, uh, we should consider redistricting um, our city so that uh, there's more than just a single a representative on the city council, which I th I'm pretty sure there's just one for the west side of Provo, um, because it's growing. It's grow one of the fastest growing areas in Provo, um, as far as new housing developments go. Um, and with Provo High going in over there, uh, I can only predict that there will be more housing uh, going into the west side of Provo. Uh, yeah, so top priority, listening. Uh, making sure there's adequate representation for West Siders. I know there's a there's a strong culture, uh, and it's, uh, West Side Provo folks have a strong sense of identity. They have different needs than people who live on the east and the north and the south sides of Provo, uh, so they need to be listened to. So the airport, Provo's airport, is it's a resource that we have, um, and. Uh, and it's a resource that we need to make sure that we're utilizing. Um, as far as expansion of the airport goes, uh, I think uh, those, that's something we'll need to look at as the population continues to grow. Uh, and we'll need to look at data surrounding that art and, and have discussions with the, peop with the townspeople in Provo um, re regarding whether they want uh, more, more airlines uh, coming into the airport and uh, um, at this point, uh, Provo's airport is, is, a, is a valuable resource that uh, we need to make sure people are taking advantage of if, if that's something that they want to be doing. Um, and uh, so I think it's important to continue to educate citizens, uh, townspeople on, on this resource, on the airport that they have in their city. Um, and I, I think the city's been fairly good about that. I remember when Allegiant added a few flights a couple years ago, the city, uh, or John Curtis uh, made a blog post about it that went around. Uh, um, but I just think continuing to educate uh, the townspeople um, and then considering further expansion as our population grows. Uh, I mean, we have a, a, an inter international airport fairly close by, so I don't, uh, I don't think expansion needs to be something uh, we prioritize immediately. In my experience, zoning compliance issues, zoning issues, residential zoning issues, um, we have this uh, zoning law uh, that essentially uh, limits the number of people living in a house to uh, three singles or or a family, um, uh, there, there are problems with this. Uh, first of all, it's a limitation, an artificial limitation on our liberty. Uh, 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 we sh if we want to live with more people in a house than that, we should be allowed to do that. Um, this zoning ordinance has made, uh, and the, the kind of crackdown on these zoning ordinances have made um, finding affordable housing difficult for low-income earners. Uh, w uh, when more people are, are allowed to live in a house together, uh, people can, can afford rent more easily. Um, on the other hand, you have problems in student housing in the Joaquin neighborhood um, where landlords are taking advantage of, of students and uh, cramming eight or nine students in a home. Uh, in those cases, I think uh, enforcing zoning issues is great. Uh, I think when it, when it benefits the townspeople uh, in situations like that, cool. Uh, uh, don't let landlords take advantage of students into it. But when it comes to just uh, this kind of classist, uh, we only want three singles living in a house because it doesn't look good to have four cars parked on the street or something. Uh, I just think it's, it's, it's paternalistic and it uh, ultimately uh, just makes things more difficult for people already struggling to find housing. So, uh, and as far as, uh, you know, lot size, uh, what is it? We've got like 
uh, minimum lot sizes and minimum, we've got density, zoning restrictions. I think these are all things that are contributing to our housing shortage. Uh, uh, developers should be able to uh, develop smaller, uh, smaller, um, and higher, smaller sized, what's the word I'm looking for? Developers should be able to develop, develop smaller smaller housing units uh, at higher, densi higher densities um, so that uh, and have different tiers of pricing uh, so that we can uh, respond to the housing shortage. Yeah, tiny homes are a fun idea. I really like uh, these creative solutions that people and uh, people all over the country have been coming up with. Um, and uh, I've, I've been reading some stuff about tiny homeless communities uh, well, tiny homes for homeless communities uh, that would be an inexpensive way to house homeless people, uh, both density and uh, uh, lot size restrictions. Uh, those things that 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 problematizes um, the housing market. Uh, so, I I think the city council and and the mayor should both. I, as mayor, I would be very uh, interested in um, getting rid of those lot size restrictions and density requirements. The city hall, the new city hall question is complicated because uh, does the city need a new city hall? Uh, I, I don't, I absolutely, absolutely think that a city hall that is uh, new, uh, and aesthetically welcoming to townspeople and accessible for disabled people. Um, I think uh, a city hall that uh, could be a center for city, city events and community activities, uh, really awesome. Uh, I, th I think uh, the city could hugely benefit from that. Um, uh, as long as... Uh, uh, there are cost issues that we need to look at, um, and I, I think before going in and uh, spending a ton of taxpayer dollars, we should uh, s consider uh, things like, does the city center really need an 800-unit uh, parking lot? And does the city center really need to be downtown? Um, I mean, directly on Center Street. Uh, could could the city center be in a more expanded vision of downtown a couple of blocks away? Or um, these are all questions we need to address. I know the current plans have the city center on a huge downtown lot um, with a park, I believe, and and a huge parking lot. Um, and I, I would love to look at those and see is this cost effective? Could we be selling this lot and finding a cheaper lot? A block or two away, uh, and have this the current lot be dedicated for you know small businesses uh, who want to open up on Center Street. Uh, uh, these are all questions we need to think of before making decisions uh, surrounding the city center. So, my vision of the city involves a city that is uh, a home for everyone, uh, where we have complete streets. Um, that are with painted bike lanes uh, and painted crosswalks uh, and public transit where people who are uh, people of all backgrounds are, are able to access uh, community resources and local businesses. Um, so complete streets are a really important part of my vision um, for the city. Uh, I also see a city with a thriving downtown and startup area that are populated by local businesses. I see uh, um, a grocery store on the west side of Provo, which is really important to a lot of folks over there. Um, I see uh, economic revitalization in East Bay, where the old Kmart was. Um, uh, I also see a city government that represents all of the people in Provo, the diverse population that Provo has and 
the even more diverse population that Provo will have in the future. Um, I see people of color in office. I see women in office. I see non-binary and other transgender people in office. Uh, I see gay people in office. I see disabled people in office. I, I see homeless people included on discussions about the camping ban because they weren't included on the original dis in the original discussion. Uh, Food and Care Coalition wasn't even included in that. Um, I see people being better represented by their government than they are today. And, and our, our city leadership, they do a good job, uh, but we need to be striving to do better. We need to uh, be more inclusive and uh, be hearing more voices. I also see uh, Provo, um, uh, there's a lot of talk about whether making Provo hip should be a goal. Uh, I, I think I am f substantially less interested in Provo being hip than I am in Provo being good for the townspeople, um, than townspeople being able to afford to live here. That's really important to me. Uh, townspeople being able to afford to do, to create art and music and start businesses. That's all on my vision for Provo. Um, a town with affordable housing, um, a town with with a uh, strong, with pride in its local economy and uh, uh, that encourages its townspeople to shop local and eat local. Um, a town where the needs of the people are listened to and met. You should vote for me because I'll listen to you. And, uh, and we probably, I mean, we already know each other. Uh, I see you every day as I bike around town. Um, uh, you should vote for me because I'm interested in supporting your small business. I, I, uh, I, I want you to be able to afford to live here and, and I don't want you to be pushed out by, uh, by, by as the population grows. I want, I want all of you who live here already, who make Provo the city that I love to live in, I want you to be able to thrive here um, and I will do whatever it takes to make that happen. So don't be afraid of my beard. Vote for Stephen Cope. <laughs> so if any of you has any questions or wants me to clarify anything I've said um, or ha if you have any ideas or you have any concerns you want to share with me, um, my website is uh, Stephen, S-T-E-P-H-E-N, is a mayor dot club. And, uh, and you can find me on Facebook, um, Stephen Cope for Provo Mayor, and uh, on Twitter, at Stephen is a Mayor, at, on Instagram, at Stephen is a Mayor. Uh, so f yeah, feel free to reach out to me um, and let me know what's important to you. Uh, uh, let me know if you've got any wild ideas that you think uh, can improve Provo, because I think Sometimes it's the wild ideas uh, that, that are the ones that get ignored, but the ones that we should be considering the most. So, yeah, uh, and re go register to vote, no matter who you're going to vote for. Uh, let's improve democracy. Let's get more people's voices heard, uh, more people's votes counted. Um, uh, register your friends to vote uh, and, and get involved in the city government. Go to city council meetings. Uh, uh, get involved in the Provo Facebook groups. Uh, I'd love to see you there and uh, see your concerns and uh, get to know you all better. So.